So welcome to Hamlin Assembly of God. I'm glad, wow, there's so many people here today. It's so exciting. Thank you everyone for coming. As I mentioned, we'll be in Philippians chapter two. I wanna read the first four verses. Philippians chapter two, verses one through four, it says this. If there is any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together in one mind and purpose. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would make it real to us this morning. Lord, as we gather together, Lord, around the scripture, Lord, I pray you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and I pray that you would encourage us and challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I read from the New Living Translation, um, and I did that on purpose. Um, I often compare translations as I'm preparing a message, and the New Living Translation took some, some phrases and turned them into questions, rhetorical questions. The message is still the same, but I just felt like um, it explained it better and it, it brought, brought it to life a little bit better than I could. A rhetorical question is one that doesn't re require an answer, that the answer is so obvious that you don't have to answer it. And in these three questions, these four questions actually, the answer is obviously yes. There's really two parts to this message. And as I started to put together a 13-point message earlier this week, I decided to spare you and try and not pack it all into to one message. So um, second half of the message will be coming at another time. There are nine or ten commands after these, these rhetorical questions, but this morning I want us to focus on these rhetorical questions. Sometimes we need encouragement. Sometimes we need rebuke. Sometimes we need to be challenged. Other times we need direction. Sometimes we need to forget, and other times we need to remember. In this text, Paul takes four questions. In the NIV, it's four parenthetical statements. In any translation, Paul writes about four things as an encouragement. The title of my message today is A Consolation in Christ. The word consolation won't be found in my text, but I see Paul, as he, before he gives instructions, which are six commands with, with different aspects to it, so there's nine different instructions Paul gives, but before he does that, he says, he asks these questions, and it sets the stage for us responding. Consolation in Christ. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yes. Is there any comfort in Christ's love? Yes. Is there any fellowship together in the spirit? Yes. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? If they're not, they will be by the end of the service. <laughs> Let's take a look at these, each one at a time. In, they're all found in verse one of Philippians chapter two. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? You know, everybody wants to belong somewhere. We all wanna feel like we fit in. We all wanna feel like we belong. One thing that's really cool about a team, if you're ever on a sports team, everyone gets the same shirt, everyone gets the same uniform, and it gives you a sense of identity. And I just got some advertisements this week for, for church shirts again, so I'm looking at it because, uh, how many of you have a Hamlin and Assembly of God shirt? Yeah? Yeah? So some of you need one. So anyway, that may be coming down the pike, but the point is, is on a team, they all dress alike because they're all part of a team. And as Christians, specifically this morning, as part of Hamlin Assembly of God, we're all part of this team. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you might be a part of another, another team. But under heaven, we're all the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Whatever the name is, if we believe in Jesus and we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, then we're all on the same team. Amen. I want you to know today that you belong to Jesus. Amen. You belong to Christ. Amen. You're on his team. And we have teammates, regardless of color, race, finances, history, background. None of those things matter when it comes to the kingdom of God. When you belong to Christ, you belong here. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus welcomed anyone and everyone, and he took some grief for it. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. God loves your neighbor. Right? God loves your neighbor, even if he throws stuff in your yard. God loves your coworkers, even if they make your work day difficult. Right? And God loves you. God doesn't show prejudice or discrimination. The Bible says God is no respecter of persons. God loves each and every one of us. We belong to Christ. No one in the kingdom of God is an outsider. Romans 10 says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Faye served, I know you served in Africa and you served in Paris as, as missionaries, right? Around the world, the gospel is preached. The gospel is not a United States thing. We used to be the, the, the greatest country for sending missionaries, and we still are. But ironically, now other countries are starting to send missionaries to the United States of America. Because we still have people in America that need Jesus. As many of you know, the Philly Dream Center is dear to my heart, that ministry. And as we've spent days with, with them down there in Philadelphia, and right now, lift up uh, David and his wife Cherie as they minister during pandemic times in Philadelphia, giving away food to, to, to families and children who need it. But that's a whole different ministry than ministering in Hamlin, Pennsylvania, right? And I was in Virginia yesterday and uh, visiting somebody, and the D.C. area is a whole different world, right? The neighborhoods are different. We drove through a neighborhood. We saw people running. They have bicycle lanes painted, painted right on the, on the roads. Not good, not bad, just different. And as we look at our country, there's a variety of people throughout the country. But if we belong to Christ, then we're all part of the same family. The Bible says a lot about ministry to the poor, but you do not have to be poor to belong. Somebody say amen. amen. The rich can belong too. Pete, where's my treasurer? I need an amen for that. We need rich people at Hamlin Assembly of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And poor people are welcome too. We need them. Every nation, every creed. I've shared it before and it, it's still, during these times, it just puts a smile on my face when we were doing Alex Ferrer's funeral and somebody said we need, we need more Puerto Ricans in this church. Yeah. 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 And I wanted to put out on the sign, wanted, Puerto Ricans. We all belong. That's right, I want to put out there, wanted. No, I'm not going there. When talking about receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we talked about that on Pentecost Sunday a few weeks ago, the Bible makes it clear that it's for both men and women. And it's for bond servants, it's for slaves. Slave and free. The gospel is for everyone. The Bible mentions it in several places. In Romans chapter 1, verse 6, and you also are among those Gentiles who are being called to belong to Christ. Gentiles, non-Jewish people. In Romans 14, 8, if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, what? We belong to the Lord. Amen. We belong to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12 Verse 15 and 16, it says, Now if the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. Now I know there are people here this morning, do not raise your hands, but I know there's people here this morning, maybe you've attended here for only a short time, maybe you've attended here for a long time, but there's some of you that don't feel like you're part of Hamlin Assembly of God. You don't feel like you fit in. You don't feel like that, that, that maybe, maybe there's people here that feel like, well, people don't like me at the church. Well, I just want you to know this morning that God loves you and we love you and we're glad you're here. And honestly, we don't care about your background. You know, two people meet in the hallway and they don't say hi because one of them is saying, I'm gonna wait for them to say hi first. The other person is saying, I'm gonna wait for them to say hi first. And so we don't make eye contact. We don't say, I don't know them very well. If there's somebody in this room you don't know, feel free to say hello to them. Because they might be feeling left out a little bit, just like you are. All right? 
God loves people with masks and without masks. And we all belong because we're family. You belong here. Why? Because of Jesus. So I want everyone to repeat after me. I belong here. here. Excellent. Number two. And Montana. Montana people belong here too. How many people do we have that are from the West Coast? I'm from the West Coast. My mom didn't raise her hand. Oh yeah, we got some California people. We love California people. Just don't go to Montana, because in Montana, they don't like California people. No, <laughs> That's true, Jerry. No. <laughs> Number two, the second rhetorical question. Paul writes, is there any comfort from his love? Any comfort from his love? I grew up, if you grew up in church, there's two songs you know. If you grew up in a Assemblies of God church, there's two songs you know. What is the, what is the number one kid song that everybody in Assemblies of God church knows? That's right, Jesus loves me. And what's the other one? Red and yellow, black and white. The song is Jesus loves the little children. We need to be singing that on major news networks right now. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Do we receive comfort from his love? Before Paul gives instruction, he reminds them again that God loves them and that we have comfort. You should experience comfort in God's love. And I know in a group this size, there's probably one or two people here, maybe more, that sometimes you have a hard time accepting God's love. That sometimes you feel like such a failure that you feel like, how could God still love me? God just puts up with me. God loves other people more than me. Or maybe you're going through a difficult time and maybe you're not hearing the answer or getting the answer to prayer that you want. And you feel like, why doesn't God love me? Why does God bless so-and-so? But I'm struggling. I want you to know this morning that God loves you. Even if you're from Montana. God loves you and he loves me. And there's comfort in knowing knowing, not just believing, but knowing that God loves you. When we truly understand how much God loves us, it brings us comfort. God's love for people, all people, can be found throughout the Bible. It's everywhere. And I'm just going to share a sampling this morning, but it's everywhere. In Romans 5a, the familiar passage, but God demonstrates his own love for this, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we came to Christ, before we belonged... Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. In John 3, 16, we know this verse, many of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son. There's a saying that goes, and you have to see it to understand it. But somebody asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And he said, this much. And he died on the cross. That's how much God loves you. He gave his son for you. We can experience comfort in his love. It's throughout the New Testament. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what communion is about. It's about remembering that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only Son. That God loved, that Jesus loved you so much that in the garden, when he had an opportunity to escape, that's very real. Jesus had an opportunity to escape. He knew what was going to happen. And he even prayed, God, if it's possible, let this cup, this cup of suffering, pass from me. Let me skip it. He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus subjected himself to crucifixion because he loved us that much. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Loved by God. God has chosen you. How much does God love us? Many of you are familiar with Romans 8, 38 through 39. Paul writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. There's nothing on this earth that can separate you from God's love. God loves you.
In the book of Psalms, 33 times it mentions the unfailing love of God. Unfailing love. God's love will never fail. So repeat after me. God loves me. The third question that's in verse 1 of Philippians 2 says, is there any fellowship together with the Spirit? In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, it says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What does that mean? What does it mean, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? In John's epistle, 1 John, it's near the back of your Bible. You don't need to turn there. John talks about fellowship. Talks about fellowship we have with God and fellowship we have with each other. Fellowship, fellow. First of all, what's a fellow? A fellow is the person next to you. It's it's somebody that you know. It's somebody that you're acquainted with. It may or may not be a friend, but it's your fellow. It's a co-worker, okay, a fellow. Just the general term of fellow. But fellowship is when you get to spend time with somebody. It's when you enjoy someone's presence or someone's company. Fellowship, being with somebody. And the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross to reconcile us to God because sin had separated us from God. And so we lost, as humankind, we lost fellowship with God because of sin. But God had a plan, and that was to offer Jesus, his son, as a sacrifice for our sins so we could be reconciled to God. So that once again, we could have fellowship with God. The Bible says that Adam and Eve would meet with God in the evening in the garden and talk to him. You know, if God would come down to my garden and talk to me, I'd actually plant one. (laughs) But God wants us to have fellowship. And it says the fellowship of the Spirit What does that mean? Jesus said he's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to send a comforter. Now, in the Old Testament, not everyone got to experience the presence of God. The Holy Spirit only came on prophets, priests, and kings. It was the exception, not the rule. But in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit's for everyone, on your sons and your daughters. We can all experience the fellowship or the presence of God now. So God does come to my garden. God wants us to have fellowship. In 1 John 1, 3, it says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. How many of you know the song in the garden? Right? In the garden, the old hymn? And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. We can have fellowship with God, not because of our righteousness, but because of what Jesus did for us. The fellowship is in the Spirit. I'm glad Jesus went back to heaven. You know why? Because Jesus could only be in one place at one time. And he'd probably be booked out for the next 15 years for preaching. We could probably never, never get him in a service. But he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's in every Bible preaching church right now across the world. And he lives in us. And so we can have fellowship with God because of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever, put your hands on this one, have you ever experienced God's presence? Have you ever felt God? Have you ever felt God in the room or in your life? Yeah, because God is real. And we can have fellowship with one another. So one of the benefits or one of the consolations we have in Christ is we have fellowship with God first, but also with one another. So stay for a bagel later. Anybody remember the old chorus, we are one in the spirit? We are one in the spirit? That was like a campfire song. It's like a camp song. But we are one. And that's why we have fellowship. We have one. We we have fellowship because of what the Lord has done and because of his Holy Spirit. And the fourth question. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Now this is supposed to be a rhetorical question. So you're all supposed to be there already. All right? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? And as Paul writes to the Philippians, he knows that they are. They've, they've blessed them in ministry. If you, if you read the book and you read some of the history, um, if you go to the book of Acts, you see how the Philippians cared for Paul the Apostle. When you see hurting people, is there a tug at your heart? 
Jesus was compassionate. In Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. In Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. In Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion for these people. In Matthew 20, 34, Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Jesus was compassionate. Be like Jesus. Be compassionate. It says that their hearts were tender. What does that mean? I often describe a pastor's heart as hard on the outside and soft on the inside. Because in any kind of leadership, if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a boss on a job, in any kind of leadership, sometimes you gotta take stuff. You gotta have hard skin sometimes. When you deal with people, I know Becky, you've never experienced that where you work, you know, but sometimes people are mean, all right? And as a Christian, sometimes we just gotta take that, all right? But many times people are hurting and sometimes their meanness comes from their hurt. And the Bible says we need to be tender-hearted, soft-hearted, not hard-hearted. We need to be soft-hearted. We need to be tender toward people who are hurting and to people who are in need. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, missionettes, girls, ministries people should remember this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We need to be kind and compassionate. James 5.11, it says, The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And 1 Peter 3.8 says, Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. As believers, we need to be like Jesus. We need to be like God. Amen. And we need to be tender towards people. We need to be soft-hearted. We need to be compassionate. We can't always meet somebody's need. We can't. But we should have a heart to do so. And if God has blessed you and you see someone in need, that's a Christian response. We should be tenderhearted. We should reach out. We should minister to that need. We should meet that need. Amen. And if we can't, we can pray. And God can meet the need. Because it's not about us anyway. Amen. In the church, so many times as we, as we read the scriptures and we think of these things, we, the emphasis, at least in my world, is on evangelism and sharing the gospel with people. And that's so important. We need to live a life that attracts people to Jesus. We want to be good public relations for Jesus, especially if you have a Christian bumper sticker or you're wearing a Christian t-shirt, okay? Or you're driving the church van, all right? So when we represent Christ, we want the world to think good of us. We, we want to, to reflect well. But it's not about people seeing us. That's not the focus. The focus is doing the right thing. And we have the need right here inside these walls. It's not all about reaching the lost. It's not all about ministering to people outside the church. I want you to take a minute, a moment right now and just look around this room. God wants us to be tenderhearted and compassionate to the people in this room. Yes, amen. Sometimes the deepest wounds Christians have, they got from other Christians. And it's because we let them in, we let them close, and the people closest to us we're the most vulnerable to. But as Christians, we need to be careful. We need to be tenderhearted and forgiving. We need to be compassionate and caring. And when we wrong somebody, sometimes we hurt somebody and we don't even know it. But we as Christians, we need to be forgiving. We need to offer forgiveness. We need to live a life of compassion, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. Encouragement from belonging to Christ. We belong to Christ. This is summary time. We need to find encouragement from that. You need to realize, you belong here. Whether you're an official member or not, if you attend Hamlin and some God, you belong here. We even have a banner somewhere, don't we, Henry, that says, you belong here. That's right. There's encouragement in that. Don't feel like you're on the outside. Receive encouragement knowing that you belong to Christ. We know that God loves us. We should know that God loves us. Our head knows it, but sometimes our heart doesn't get it. You need to find comfort in that. That no matter what you're facing, that Jesus is there with you. 
and that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. We have fellowship together in the Spirit. We are one because of God's Spirit. We belong to one another. We're responsible for one another. And our hearts are tender and compassionate because God has changed our hearts. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Again, I want you to repeat after me. I belong here. God loves me. We are one in the Spirit. It's so true. It's so true. The next time I preach, which won't be next week because I have a guest speaker next week, came thousands of miles to come and speak on Father's Day. But after that, I'm going to talk about the commands that Paul follows with. But it's based on these, these prerequisites. We need to understand that God cares about us. And that he commands us to do things because of his love for us. Not because he's trying to punish us or ruin our life, but God wants what's best for us. Amen. God loves you. You belong to him. We are one in his spirit. And we have tender hearts because of what Jesus did for us. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to address Christians first, just for a moment. Maybe there's someone here this morning and you'd say, Pastor... I struggle with accepting God's love. I struggle feeling like I belong or that I'm important to God or to anybody else. I struggle having fellowship with people. That I need people and, and I feel like I don't have people in my life. Or maybe my heart is hard. If you're struggling in any of those areas, first of all, I want you to know that God really does love you and that God really does care about you and that he's here for you today. But if you struggle in one of those areas, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and put it back down because I want to know how to pray for you. I want to encourage you. Thank you for being honest this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Some good, solid Christians raised their hand because this is a common feeling. The enemy wants to steal this from us. Lord, I pray for your people today. Lord, I pray for those specifically who raised their hands. And Lord, I pray for those that may not have raised their hands. Jesus, I pray right now you would put a picture in our mind. Jesus, if you're hanging on the cross with your arms outspread and you said, Father, forgive them. Jesus, you were saying that. You were called, Father, forgive Ken for what he's done. Jesus, as you hung on that cross, you did it because you loved us. Lord, I pray that nobody would leave here today thinking that you don't love them. Jesus, I pray you'd wrap your arms of love around people right now in this congregation. Lord God, I pray that people would realize, Lord God, that you love them no matter what they've done, no matter what sin they've experienced. Lord God, let them know that you care about them. Lord, I pray around this room, Lord God, that you would wrap your love, your Holy Spirit of love around people that feel like they don't belong, that feel like that nobody cares about them. Lord, help them to realize that first you care about them. And Lord God, help us all to be tender-hearted and compassionate. Lord God, help us to never let somebody at Hamlin Assembly of God feel like they're left out. Lord God, help us to never let, let a Christian brother or sister struggle when we have the means to help them. But Lord God, help us to truly be one in the Spirit. Lord God, help us to manifest your love. Jesus, help us to be your disciple, your follower. Jesus, you had compassion. Give us compassion. Lord God, help us to feed the hungry. Lord, help us to heal the sick. Lord God, help us to encourage the discouraged. Lord God, help us not to be afraid to go out to lunch with a sinner or somebody struggling or somebody that the, our society would say is no good. Lord, I pray for, for David and Sherry right now in Philadelphia. Lord God, I pray you continue to use them in ministry. Lord God, ministering to people, Lord God, that are, that are, are, are homeless, Lord God, or people that are struggling, or, Lord God, or people that are living in poverty, Lord God. Those people aren't any worse people than we are, Lord. They're just people. They're just people you died for, Jesus. I pray you just bless that ministry and use it for your glory. But Lord God, use us in Hamlin too and in Pike County and in Monroe County and Wayne County and Lackawanna County. Lord God, wherever we come from, Lord God, help us to be your hand extended, Lord. Lord, help us to love on people. Lord, help us to have comfort in your love and encouragement, Lord God, in belonging to you. But Lord, help us to share it and not keep it to ourselves. Lord God, help us, each and every one. Lord, help us to be what you want us to be. But Lord, help us to receive this morning. Lord, next time I preach, I'll, I'll tell us what we need to go and do. But Lord, I pray right now around this room that we would receive your love. Lord God, help us to receive the fact that we belong. 
Lord God, we don't have to be a superstar Christian to belong, Lord. We don't have to have attended here for 50 years, Lord God, to belong. But Lord, we belong to you. Lord, we belong here. Lord, I pray you'd minister that truth to our hearts today. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today that hasn't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, maybe there's someone here today they haven't said invited you, Jesus, into their lives. Lord, they're not a Christian, or maybe they don't even know what that means to be a Christian, but, but maybe they think they're a Christian, Lord, but they're not really a follower of you, Jesus, and they want to be today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's someone here today that say, Pastor Ken, I'm not really a believer. I don't really live for God, but I'd like to join God's family today. I want to belong to Christ. If you want to just raise your hand and put it back up so I know how to pray. You don't have to be embarrassed. If you want to follow Christ today, just raise your hand, put it back down. That's okay. I'm still going to pray a prayer of salvation. Maybe there's someone you don't, you just, you want to put your hand up, but you're afraid to. If you just say, dear Jesus, come into my life. I believe that you're God's son and you died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, come into me and fill me with your love and your peace. Take away my sin and help me to live for you. If you'll pray like that this morning, the Bible says to those who believed on Jesus, to those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for each person that has come today. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that it's true. Lord, I pray that it would be a comfort to those that have come today, to those that might be listening online. Lord, I pray you would encourage them, Lord God, and minister to their need. And Lord, help us to receive this encouraging word that's from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for coming.